welcome to the seminar across the Atlantic uh, 2022 with a really important theme this afternoon, which is quality uh, insurance in continuing education, finding mechanisms to guarantee excellence. Uh, as you know, this seminar is organized and offered by uh, UCAN, the U European University Continuing Education Network, AAAs, which stands for uh, American Association for Adults on Continuing Education, and UPSIA, which is a University Professional and Continuing Education Association. Uh, this is uh, this uh, joint initiatives where we really have uh, views from uh, the two sides of the Atlantic. Uh, I'm Pascal Pachoud from the Formation Continue UNILIPFL, which is a continuing education foundation of the University of Lausanne and EPFL in uh, Lausanne, Switzerland. I'm also a member of the UCAN Steering Committee. Before we start, just a, a couple of Zoom housekeeping requests and suggestions. Um, please make sure you mute your microphone when, you, when you're not speaking. Uh, it would be really nice if you add uh, the name of your city and location with your name. It's always nice so we can see a bit uh, where people come from. You can do that by clicking on the three dots on your picture. I really don't hesitate to use the chat to write uh, comments, give references, ask questions. Uh, we will have plenty of time to uh, discuss uh, the various uh, comments and questions. So as I said, the uh, topic for today is uh, quality insurance in continuing education. Uh, in a rapidly changing world where knowledge and skills must be updated uh, almost on an ongoing basis, universities must constantly adapt their continuing education offer to the needs of professionals and offer more and more flexible pathways to learners. Uh, be it online or face-to-face -face or a combination of both. In that context, how can we guarantee the quality of the programs offered? How can we ensure that continuing education programs are not only perceived as responding quickly to the market needs, but also as fulfilling the quality requirement of an excellent program? Considering this, we will answer some of the following questions today. What are the mechanisms to ensure the quality of programs? What do some top universities do to ensure quality? Are there differences between North America and Europe? To do that, today we have the privilege to welcome three guests, two speakers, Lindsay Elamud from uh, University of College Cork in Ireland, Steve Mulligan from Study Portals in the US, and Professor Tricia Berry from Purdue University, Global University in the US, which is an online university. Uh, Tricia will, uh, will be the moderator of the, of the discussions. Um, I suggest that we uh, start with uh, the first presentation for today. Uh, Lindsay uh, Elamud from University College Cork We'll speak about uh, achieving excellence through quality enhancement, the view from University College Cork. Lindsay is Assistant Director in Adult Continuing Education uh, at University College Cork within uh, the unit uh, ACE. A core focus for her in this role is to help achieve the vision for ACE to be an international leader in the provision of accessible diverse and inclusive educational opportunities for adult learners, acting as a catalyst for transformation for the students, enterprises and communities with whom they engage in order to benefit society as a whole. Uh, please write uh, your questions in the chat. We will have plenty of time to discuss after the second presentation. The floor is yours, Lindsay. Thank you, Pascal, and good afternoon, everybody from an unusually sunny Ireland for a change. Uh, I'm delighted to be here with you all today to share some of my experiences around the topic of quality assurance. Um, so you'll see here my, the title of my presentation is the ACE approach to quality assurance in continuing education, 
moving beyond QA box ticking to a genuine quality culture. So before we get started, I just want to set the scene a little and introduce you to Adult Continuing Education or ACE at UCC. Uh, on an annual basis, we have approximately 3000 part-time students enrolled in ACE. About 70% of those are registered on accredited programs leading to awards on our Irish National Framework of Qualifications. We have over 130 distinct programs, although this is growing rapidly with the introduction of micro credentials over the last 18 months. We deliver programs across all four colleges in our university and address a very broad range of disciplines. And we deliver our flexible part-time programs through a variety of different methods, including outreach, in-class, online, blended, uh, and hopefully as we move forward to a, a post-COVID situation that we're, we're all hoping for, we're looking at the majority of our programs continuing in, in some way of a, a blended fashion going forward based on all of our learning uh, through the crisis of online delivery over the past two years and, and what, what has been working well for our students. So now you know a little bit uh, about ACE, we can move on to the important topic of quality assurance. So I think it's critical for us to recognize the importance of context when it comes to quality assurance, given that all of us here today are from different geographical regions. We have different external drivers that shape our quality assurance focus. For my unit in Ireland, the key drivers shaping our agenda come from a European context, a national Irish context, and an institutional context within my university. At a European level, quality assurance has attracted a lot of attention uh, in the European higher education since around the early 2000s. Significant work has been undertaken to try to assure the quality of teaching and learning in European higher education, which was one of the key aims of the Bologna process. Indeed, one of the core purposes of the Bologna Declaration in 1999 was to encourage European cooperation in quality assurance of higher education with a view to developing comparable criteria and methodologies. Following many years of work in May 2015, the ministers responsible for higher education in the European higher education area then adopted the standards and guidelines for quality assurance in the European higher education, commonly known as the ESG. The ESG then aimed to set a framework for quality assurance systems applying to teaching and learning activities in European higher education institutions, including continuing education. As well as developments at a European level, uh, national legislation is also one of the key external drivers, um, the key external forces driving the quality assurance within UCC. The Irish Universities Act of 1997 grants oversight of the Irish higher education sector to the, I the Higher Education Authority, or HEA, this oversight role granted to the HEA ensures that there is accountability for quality assurance processes all across uh, higher education institutions in Ireland. Another significant piece of Irish legislation is the Qualifications and Quality Assurance Act of 2012, which established our Quality and Qualifications Ireland Agency. This is an independent state agency responsible for promoting quality and accountability in education and training services all across Ireland. So all of this then impacts on the institutional level as UCC has to be compliant with both national and European directives as our university is recognized as a, an autonomous degree awarding body under the terms of the Qualifications and Quality Assurance Act, which, which gives us responsibility for assuring and enhancing the quality of its education, our research and all of our allied services. So to achieve this, my university has comprehensive internal and external quality assurance procedures, meeting both the national and European standards with a strong focus on enhancing the quality of all our activities. Uh, I think it's also important to note here that there has been a shift over the past few years in my university from a quality assurance to a quality enhancement ethos. The idea of the enhancement ethos is both to challenge and support the systematic examination of what we do as a university in order to enable and promote excellence in serving our students, our stakeholders, and our wider community, 
in terms of our academic offerings, our research and all the other activities we do as a university. So now that uh, you have a brief overview of the context that we're operating in, I want you to take you through the ACE approach to quality assurance in a, in a little bit more detail. For us, it's very important that all of our stakeholders, our students, our employers, partners, etc., are satisfied with the quality of our programmes. We're not just selling diplomas that respond to market need, but we're offering our learners a holistic university learning experience. So the next part of the presentation is going to focus on reviewing the work that we do in four key areas, planning and design, implementation and delivery, program monitoring and program improvement. So let's start with uh, planning and design. Within ACE, we do our best to take a demand led responsive approach to program development. We work with a very wide array of external stakeholders in industry and enterprise, in the community, the third sector, et cetera, to try and identify areas of learning needs that we can then help address through our programs. By taking this approach, we can quickly identify a clearly defined target group, which can then help us to get a strong understanding of the core needs of the learners. We then take a dual disciplinary design approach to our programs where we try to infuse them all with an adult education ethos where we respect our learners previous life and professional experiences. We encourage the learner voice and we try to empower our students to take ownership of their learning. Each program is also provided with disciplinary oversight from the anchor school academic school or department in the respective discipline in our university. And this also helps to ensure that core disciplinary norms and academic underpinnings are adhered to in each of our different programs. Taking a learner centric approach has been critical to the success of ACE. We need to ensure that the learner is at the forefront of our minds as we take key decisions about program structure, whether that's a decision over how many credits we can deliver in a year. Would it be better to deliver 50 credits in one academic year? Or given that the majority of our students are working full time and have family commitments, should we spread that over two years, for instance? When we think about delivery methods, we also need to consider whether online or blended learning might be appropriate for our students to help cut down on the time they need to be physically present in the classroom. When it comes to things like assessment methods, we also need to consider the assessments that might be most impactful for our learners. So, for example, would a two hour written exam or a problem based learning project better equip our students with the skills they will need in the real world? The final stage of this process involves our compliance with the university curriculum development processes, which help to clearly define a program's curriculum, the program aims and objectives, the module learning outcomes, and indeed provides quality assurance of the overall award. Now, this is, a, is it's an important stage, so I'm going to talk you through this in a, in a little bit more detail uh, about one particular programme that we approved uh, a couple of years ago. The whole process that I'm going to describe here took approximately six, 16 weeks. Uh, our typical time frame for curriculum approval is somewhere between 10 and 16 weeks, but we have in the past had to turn programmes uh, around uh, faster than that when there was uh, an urgent need to be met. So the genesis for this particular program, the Diploma in Management Practice, came from the Regional Skills Forum here in, in uh, the Cork area. This is a government funded body that explores skill needs in industry and enterprise, and then tries to work with higher education institutions to develop programs that meet these needs. So in this case, the Regional Skills Forum manager reached out to me after a, she held a roundtable meeting with approximately 30 companies in our region who had identified a need for enhanced management skills for people managers, as they had identified a, a practice where people had been internally promoted within organisations, but they had little or no formal education or training in management, and that tended to lead to problems uh, as they try to lead their, their assigned teams. So I worked with the Regional Skills Forum and a focus group of companies to tease out exactly what kind of uh, skills would be needed in, in such a programme. 
I then approached the Department of Management and Marketing in my university to see if they would be willing to partner with us on the development of a course to meet these needs. And once they were in agreement, we proceeded to tease out how we could align the practical skills needs identified by industry with an academic program. So once we had a broad idea of how we could approach this, we then worked with our industry partners to try and devise the most suitable delivery and assessment methods for the cohort of learners we would be targeting the program at. As the vast majority of them would be working full time in management roles already, we decided to devise the program on a part time modular basis with a key focus on applied learning so that students could take their learning from the classroom and apply it immediately into their workplace. We agreed that a continuous assessment methodology would be more appropriate than formal exams. And we worked with the program team to devise an assessment strategy focused on real world problems. So one assessment involved uh, a role play where the students had to conduct a performance review. Another assessment involved them working in small groups where they had to devise a marketing strategy for a fictional company. And then another involved the students uh, completing a self-reflective journal where they examined their own management style. We then proceeded to prepare all of the program approval documentation required by the university, but we did this in a, in a very iterative way with uh, continuous engagement with all of the key stakeholders, including our teaching team, industry partners, and past students of similar programs. So the curriculum approval process in my university is a two-stage process. Uh, for stage one, we had to submit the outline program proposal document for approval to the anchor academic school, in this case, the Department of Management and Marketing. Once that was secured, we proceeded to seek approval from the College of Business and Law, one of UCC's four colleges. And then as a program team, we presented the program approval documentation to our ACE Academic Standards Board, which is my unit's uh, curriculum development committee. So once approval was granted here, the proposal was then submitted to the university's academic board for full approval. So you can see that this, this first stage is a very um, comprehensive and uh, robust process. Stage two approval then involved preparation of the full program planning documentation. So this is where the real nuts and bolts of the program are established, the program learning outcomes, the module descriptors, all of the, the, the core focus of the program has to be developed. Once that was completed, uh, it again had to be signed off by the anchor department and the college involved. So when we finally get all of this documentation in place and signed off, uh, we had the let me say, joy of a, a program approval panel ahead of us. Now, the best way I can describe a program approval panel meeting is like a, a mini PhD Viva, where there is a robust interrogation of the planned program. So usually in attendance, we have internal assessors representing a variety of university committees. We have two external assessors who are academics in other institutions, preferably outside of the Irish higher education sector. We also invite an employer representative to share their perspective and a student representative as the learner voice is, is really critical to us. The program approval panel meetings follow a predefined agenda, usually take about uh, two hours. Uh, approval can be granted subject to binding conditions or non-binding recommendations or may even be uh, refused entirely. Now, thankfully, that hasn't happened to any of our proposals in ACE, um, but we're always uh, under the, 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 the fear that it is a, a real possibility. So in this particular case, the programme was approved subject to recommendations from the panel, which the programme team considered after the meeting and actually ended up implementing because the, the small changes uh, recommended by the external assessors actually made the programme stronger at the end of the day so even though the process can be quite daunting and seem quite bureaucratic uh, at some points of it, it is still a very useful process and the programmes tend to come out stronger at the end of it. So moving on to stage two, which is implementation and delivery. Uh, it's really vital for us to ensure that the delivery approach we devised in, in stage one is suitable for each target group. So this might require some tweaking as, as new cohorts of learners emerge. 
Uh, also, a critical aspect in this phase for us is our focus on the student experience. Given the profile of our students, many of whom may have been outside of formal education for a number of years and may be anxious about being in a university setting, the pastoral support provided by our staff in ACE is vital. Each programme has a dedicated programme coordinator who acts as the first point of contact for students. And many of our students over the years reported that they may have actually withdrawn from a programme were it not for the support um, and encouragement that they received from their programme coordinator. So this really is a, a critical role for us. Monitoring student progress and engagement is also vital in preventing attrition. Uh, our programme coordinators monitor attendance at class as well as on our online virtual learning environment uh, in an effort really to try and uh, trigger an early warning system if a student is absent from class a few times or, or fails to engage online. And once this is identified, a package of wraparound supports can be put in place to try and keep the, the student on their, their learning journey and prevent them from, from early attrition. We also need to ensure uh, that our students have access to suitable facilities and services. So we work closely with uh, colleagues right across the university to ensure that the students have access to things like training on how to use the library or training on the IT systems. We also know that it's important for us to maintain frequent communication with our students so that they know we are engaged in supporting them and giving them the information they need as they need it. And finally, then we try our best to ensure transparency around our processes, whether that might relate to admissions or assessment or mitigation, whatever it is. We try to provide students with upfront information about all of these processes in their student handbook at the beginning of the year. The teaching team for our programmes is also critical to their success. Uh, on each of our programmes, we try to ensure a blend of act academic and practitioner teaching staff, whether they be community workers or, or leaders in industry. We feel that this helps uh, to ensure that our students get both the academic and practical knowledge and skills of their chosen topic. Each of our programmes has an academic director from the anchor school or department within the university. And we also uh, encourage teaching on our programmes from among the full-time faculty within the, uni the university. Finally, we have a large panel of part-time lecturers who work with us once they have been approved through our rigorous uh, lecture approval system. This involves a candidate making an application, which includes a, a CV, an application form, detailing their qualifications, their previous teaching and training experience, copies of their parchments and transcripts for any qualifications they hold. Um, the vast majority of our teaching staff are qualified to at least master's level, uh, but many also have uh, PhDs as well. Um, applicants also have to provide uh, references. Um, there's a reference check done on those. So once all of that documentation is submitted, each application is reviewed by the program coordinator and program academic director. And if they're supportive of the, the application, it's presented to the ACE Academic Standards Board for approval for uh, a three-year term. Once that term ends, the candidates must reapply for admission to the teaching panel. Um, so while this kind of seems like an awful lot of work, I, I think in taking this in-depth approach, we can be confident of the quality of our teaching staff, which is then integral to the quality of our delivery of our programmes. In implementing the programme, we also need to ensure that learners achieve the defined programme learning outcomes. And we do this through regular teaching team meetings where programme content is discussed and any gaps or duplication of material can be identified uh, and addressed. And this is also helped by having our external examiners review and advise upon the programme assessment strategy before we issue uh, assignment group briefs to, to our students. So you can see that there's a lot of work goes in at the, the phase two stage just to make sure all of our quality checks and balances are in place. Moving on to phase three then, which is uh, program monitoring. Again, an area we take really, really seriously in my unit. Um, for us, student feedback and the learner voice is key to the monitoring of our programs. So we do our best to seek anonymous feedback from students at the end of each module and then at the end of the program overall. 
some of the questions are, are focused on uh, quantities of data. They're addressed through using a scale like the Likert scale. But we also allow for a number of uh, open-ended questions where students have the opportunity to highlight aspects of the programme that they either really enjoyed or areas where they feel improvements could be made. And oftentimes there are some really useful uh, suggestions made there by the students. So, so it's, it's, it's a useful tool for us. Um, as I mentioned previously, each of our programmes also has an external examiner who has to be nominated by the respective programme team and then approved by the ACE Academic Standards Board and our University External Examiners Committee. Uh, over the last several years, we've made um, a, a really strong effort to try and internationalize our uh, external examiners beyond the British Isles. So we now have quite a few examiners based in the US, in Australia and in, in countries all across Europe. Um, and this is it, it's really useful for us to get perspectives of people in, in lots of different uh, geographical regions. So the role of the external examiner is to uh, assure the academic standards and advise on the quality of teaching, learning and assessment on our programmes. They help to confirm that programme academic standards are consistent with the uh, academic uh, outcomes specified, that they are comparable to those achieved in the discipline area in equivalent universities internationally. And the externs do this through reviewing samples of student work at the end of each of our academic cycles and they then attend our uh, examination boards where they provide uh, comments on the overall performance of the students and as the, the programmes overall. And then on an annual basis they also have to submit a, a written report on uh, programme performance to the university. Each of our programmes also has a programme committee with a set terms of reference. Um, all of the key stakeholders in the programme are members of that committee, including the teaching team, the programme coordinator, academic director, uh, external partners, if there are any. And then we also include uh, student representatives to have the, the learner voice as well. Um, and it's really vital for us to have broad representation on these committees so that we can view the performance of our programmes from a, a multiplicity of different perspectives. So the committee meet uh, twice a year, uh, usually once in advance of the new academic term and once to review the previous academic year. And at that particular meeting, the programme committee review the past year, uh, giving consideration to key developments. Um, they identify any issues of concern and uh, actions to address them, as well as aspects of, of good practice. They recommend future programme developments and they recommend amendments to the programme for subsequent uh, consultation with relevant parties, including the external examiners. And the programme coordinator then collates all of this information into uh, an annual report for the programme. So the final phase in our QA cycle focuses on programme improvement. So if in the previous phase, a programme committee identifies a need for curriculum change, then the university's curriculum change process kicks in. Uh, like the new program proposal, uh, the approval must be sought from the academic anchor school, the lead college, and then the final proposal is presented to our ACE Academic Standards Board for approval. So we're, we're really trying to ensure there are checks and balances at every stage to help assure the quality of our programmes. The other key uh, step in this phase is the collation of all of the external examiner reports from the last phase into a single composite report, as well as a composite report of all of the program committee reports. So each of these composite reports highlights uh, good practice in some of our programs that could be shared across other programs. And it also helps to surface areas of common concern that might have emerged across a number of programs. So they're really useful documents that we produce on an annual basis that then help to inform our decision-making using an evidence-based approach. One example of change arising from this process was uh, a couple of years ago when a number of external examiners and program committees highlighted that our students were struggling with academic writing, even though we had shared numerous uh, written study guides and, and uh, academic writing guides with them. So as this was a common concern that arose across multiple programs, we decided to work with the Skills Centre in our university 
to devise a calendar of workshops throughout the year specifically for our students. They're delivered uh, in the evenings and on Saturday mornings, so they suit our students who are working full time and they're only attended by our adult learners. So it's, it's really providing a safe space for our students to be able to, to express their concerns and share the areas that they're struggling with and not feeling conscious about doing that um, in a room with, you know, maybe a group of 20 year old undergraduate students. Um, to date, they have proved hugely successful. They're always full to capacity. And uh, our external examiners actually at the last round of academic boards noted a significant improvement uh, in terms of the, the quality of academic writing of the students. So we can see they're having a, a real impact as well. Oh, I skipped one, sorry. So after that whistle stop tour of ACE, uh, on what we do to ensure the quality of our offerings, uh, I suppose I have a number of key lessons to take away. The first one really is to make quality assurance work for you, to believe in it. Yes, quality assurance can be a pain and sometimes it seems like more needless paperwork after more needless paperwork and lots of bureaucracy and red tape. But if you can find a way to really make it meaningful for you, then it can be a great advantage to your unit. Another lesson, I suppose, is to always keep the learners at the heart of it. Um, everything we do is for our learners. And by taking a learner centric approach, we never lose sight of that. Involving a broad range of different stakeholders in the process uh, is definitely an advantage as having different perspectives really does enhance the program. It avoids that whole echo chamber piece where everybody's just repeating the same thing. The different perspectives are really, really useful. And lastly then, we're all learning all of the time. So by having a, a growth mindset, being open to change and continuous improvement, then quality assurance becomes an integral part of your work as you build robust and transparent processes and you continue to reflect and learn in order to improve, just as we encourage our students to do. So thank you very much for uh, your time and attention. Thank you very much, uh, Lindsay, for this great presentation of uh, very impressive work being done at, uh, at ACE. There are already some uh, excellent questions in the chat, but uh, we'll keep it for the discussion uh, facilitated by, by Tricia Berry. Uh, let's move to the second presentation, uh, which will be presented by Steve Mulligan from uh, Study Portals in the US. Uh, Stephen is the Chief Commer Commercial Officer of North America for Study Portals. He has over uh, 19 years of experience in higher education, focused on strategic enrollment, management, and operation. Uh, Stephen also serves as Chair-elect for the International Network for Professional Development of UPSIA. Stephen holds an MBA in International Business from Keller Graduate School. He is a strong believer of international and intercultural experiences for the benefit of personal and professional development, as well as society at large. Uh, Stephen, the floor is yours. Thank you for that introduction, Pascal, and uh, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining today. So I, I provide a unique experience um, perspective when it comes to the quality assurance in continuing education. Um, most institutions are reliant on their own institutional research um, or historical data. Um, when it comes to enrollment um, uh, numbers or enrollment reports, they may also use reports such as UNESCO or Open Doors reports. Um, this data is always based on the past and um, can provide a good baseline um, when you think about what courses uh, you're going to be delivering or markets where uh, they've been popular in the past. Um, they do provide good reflection of what has worked and um, what has not worked. Uh, with study portals, we actually are at the very early stage of the decision process on uh, student search um, and when they're looking at what program, where to study, and which um, modality. So um, in this session, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to really talk about, um, you know, there's a, a breadth and um, quantity of data at our disposal that can be very overwhelming um, when coming to make a decision. It can be stressful and confusing. 
um, rather than making it uh, informed decision making. Um, so we are going to take a look at uh, using data to um, visualize um, how to find the right students at the right point in time. Um, we'll look at what student behavior data is telling us about student wants and needs today and in the future. And then we're going to illustrate uh, the trends in student interest, supply and demand um, for graduate programs um, all over the world. Um, while there can be a lot of benefits in taking on campus programs, um, as we know with COVID-19, that kind of uh, fast forwarded uh, our need to um, look at different delivery models, um, whether that's online or hybrid. Um, so we will do a deeper dive into looking at um, what, what's really um, interesting for students um, and what format uh, and what market uh, is, is their opportunity. So one of the many lessons learned uh, in the past few years is that it is essential for institutions to be nimble. Um, students can be very fickle um, and they expect more out of their institutions. So um, I, I like this quote uh, that uh, Michael Searle, um, who's the president of Paul Quinn College says, um, universities that are going to come out of this situation are the ones who are less in love with their traditions and more in love with their students. So I thought this was very um, poignant for us to kind of start off our discussion um, because uh, what we do day in, day out, it's really student centric. Um, it's all about the students. And so I just thought this was a good uh, way to kind of start our um, dialogue. So giving you a little bit more um, insight of the power of study plus data. Um, each year, our user base grows. Um, we've been able to do a side-by-side -side comparison of English hot programs offered globally. Um, through our analysis, we can see correlation between um, the student interest or demand versus the global supply of English top programs. Um, the supply detail provides prospective students with me metadata. So like course descriptions, location, modality, uh, tuition fees or entry requirements. Um, we take this information and cross-reference it against uh, student interest or demand information. For example, SEO terms that students are using to search for programs, um, what other programs or institutions globally that he or she is uh, also looking at in the same session. Um, and then also students' preferences or demographics, so where uh, he or she is located. Um, this provides us a holistic view of who is searching for what program, when, and where they're located. Uh, this information allows us to predict future uh, programs um, uh, of what student would like to study uh, typically, a uh, prospective student uh, using our platforms are searching um, anywhere between 15 or 18 months out. However, this can be much shorter on the graduate side or short courses where uh, the student journey typically is anywhere between six and nine months. So this slide has a lot of information. However, I just want to point out um, uh, the reliability of our data. So, we have a large sample size. Um, we have over 52 million unique prospective students using our platform annually. It's a free service for students to use, and we actually represent over 210 countries around the world. Um, we currently have 90% of all English taught programs on our platform. So whether a university is a partner or not, we will list it. And we do that because we wanna be student centric. Uh, we wanna be fully transparent so that they uh, can find all their um, study choice options and, and they can find the best fit. Our goal is by the end of this year that we will list all English uh, top um, programs um, 100%. Um, our, dashboard, our dashboards allow you to visualize your data by filtering down um, information so you can make specific insights on segments um, you're searching for. Now, each market is different. Uh, data can focus your recruitment you can monitor trends to know how uh, innovative your academic offerings are. Students are savvier than ever now, and it's more important to, now more than ever for you to make sure you're meeting students where they are um, with the right mission, uh, math, sorry, message uh, and the right offer, uh, offering. Uh, so quality is very important to students. Now, what I wanted to do first is take a quick global perspective of uh, student interests and in programs um, looking at the last uh, four years. This chart shows you the global share of traffic. Um, these are the four biggest uh, destinations um, which collect 50% of the global traffic. So 
Um, the markets you see here are representing the UK, United States, Canada, and Australia. Again, keep in mind, these are the, the top four for English top programs. What you can see here is over the last few years, Australia has steadily been declining. That's not a surprise um, with the borders being closed in Australia the last couple of years. Um, Canada has been rising uh, and uh, US is rebounding. Um, the UK had a surge during Corona, but now it's getting more stable. Um, and again, this is all levels of education, but what I'd like to do is do a deeper dive and take a look at uh, the graduate side. So although all levels seem to be um, dropping in 2022, interest in master's level programs um, are at record highs compared to 2018. Uh, you can see that bachelor's programs have a slight decline and all other uh, programs that are listed here, that would be PhD programs or short courses. Um, there has been a decline. Um, the one area that I just wanted to point out, uh, the largest decline for probably the short courses would be ESL programs. Um, Open Doors has reported that there are, has been a 50% decline in ESL programs since 2020. This here is a, a closer look just at graduate specifically. So um, the two elements that emerge on this is the increase in interest towards Canadian um, offerings is even larger. Um, and the US has successfully recovered uh, to pre-pandemic uh, levels. But it's still important to monitor these trends as uh, they represent the very early stages of the student interaction um, with, our, with your offerings. This here is specifically taking a look at um, on-campus delivery uh, programs that had dropped um, but rebounded in 2021 uh, compared to uh, online or flexible uh, methods um, and how they grew um, during the pandemic. Um, after lockdowns and, and closing of borders, it, it's not surprising that online campus, uh, or sorry, on-campus um, programs dropped um, to a three-year low. Um, you, we know that COVID-19 encouraged us to be very innovative and creative, uh, be create, create out of the box thinking in educational settings. Um, we had to provide engaging um, learning experiences for students to uh, and instructors just to uh, make them feel in included. Um, it's extremely important to focus on uh, capacity building of faculty so they become more familiar with online learnings and approaches. Um, E-learning tools, uh, using innovative technologies and facilitating teaching and learning um, are, are essential for uh, students to feel like they're, they're getting what they're paying for. Um, besides integration of technologies in classes, efforts should be made to include rigorous quality assurance methods, quality matters, um, and continuous quality improvements, as this will allow faculty to think about changes that could be made to further uh, enhance teaching and learning. This here is a quick look at uh, student interest um, across the four markets, again, that I mentioned. Uh, further on into this presentation, I will do a deeper dive into more of a global perspective of the top countries of interest and uh, source countries. But this here is just showing that um, interest in UK online programs had surged over the last couple of years. Um, there's been a number of factors that I think have been propelling this growth. A lot can be attributed to the flexible timeline of e-learning courses, um, which provides learners with instant access to course materials as part of their requirements. Um, other uh, uh, online um, countries that, that have seen somewhat of a decline would be the United States, Australia. Canada has been kind of uh, uh, consistent, um, and Canada, is, uh, sorry, Germany is seeing uh, a, a bit of a spike during the pandemic. Now, as I mentioned, um, we were gonna talk about a little bit about where is the global interest post uh, COVID? So this here is the, the difference in global student interest for graduate programs based on modality. So we did see a decline, not a surprise during the pandemic, um, but on campus only has um, uh, re bounced back. Um, we are seeing that there is a bit of a decline now post pandemic for blended or um, online specific, um, but there is still opportunity and, and we'll see that as we look at some of the disciplines on, on future slides. So here is uh, a look at some of the disciplines. So we're gonna first start large. Um, on this slide, this is uh, graduate specific uh, programs for uh, the, the five 
uh, biggest disciplines on um, business management, social sciences, engineering, technology, computer science and IT, and medicine and health. What you can see here is that the interest in graduate disciplines for business and management, as well as computer science uh, and IT have been growing. Uh, medical and health remain flat, um, and there's a slight decline in interest in social science programs. This doesn't mean that there aren't, um, there still isn't an, uh, areas of opportunity within each of these faculties, um, but it's important to differentiate yourself from the rising competition um, and delivering on promises uh, of what students will expect to get from you once they enroll in your said program. Now, this is a, a deeper dive. Um, this is showing you the, uh, the difference in uh, student interest for graduate programs before and after COVID. So this graph shows you um, in order of popularity um, uh, disciplines uh, globally. And what you can see here is that the disciplines in uh, computer science and IT, education and training, humanities, and law are growing year over year. Uh, however, there has been a, a, a decline in all other disciplines, um, the largest being in agriculture and forestry, uh, journalism and media, hospitality, uh, leisure and sport, and applied sciences. Um, although the program levels, uh, you, you may see a drop in overall student interest, this is just the surface. Um, there's still many opportunities uh, in certain markets or with sub-disciplines um, that can help you stand out uh, amongst the competition. Um, providing prospective uh, students with a clear, uh, concise, and relevant information will ensure you're not only attracting the best fit student, but you're also going to be able to retain them. Now, I'm, I'm going to do a, a deeper dive in the, the interest uh, in students based on countries. So on the left-hand side uh, of this, uh, a graph, what you're seeing is the top five countries that have risen in student interest for uh, pro, um, enrolling in student, uh, sorry, enrolling in programs over the last few years. Um, Poland, for instance, offers some really excellent uh, uh, programs. Um, they, they have great career opportunities and the cost of living is much lower than a lot of the European countries, um, making it very attractive uh, for those living on a student budget. Uh, Austria might be a smaller country, but um, it's widely recognized as one of the best uh, livable countries in the world. Um, they also offer free education for EU students, um, and they're uniquely situated uh, having eight different countries that they border. So um, Australia provides students with easy access to really get a diverse cultural experience in every direction um, when they leave the country. Um, Canada um, offers a welcoming environment uh, with a lot of employment opportunities. International students can work up to three years uh, after they graduate on a post-graduation work permit, um, providing them a gateway to permanent employment. Now on the right-hand side, you can see destinations that have had a decline on the last number of years. Um, now, some of this can be attributed to political unrest. Uh, for example, Denmark, they made a conservative effort uh, to limit the number of English top programs in 2021. Um, whereas in the US, we had a few years of residual effects uh, for the past administration um, are also known as the, the Trump effect. This here is showing you um, the highest and lowest source countries for international students interested in studying programs. So on the left hand side, you'll see the top six countries that are growing in um, promoting student exchange, whereas on the uh, right hand side, you're seeing these countries that are losing out to competition as competition starts to heat up. Now, the numbers aren't uh, um, drastic as some of these countries, the, the size of the population might be relatively small um, for the ones I'm outlining on the left-hand side. Those on the right, they, uh, they're prominent, predominantly the, those countries that have um, kind of been the, the, the leaders in attracting international students for, for several years. Now, the rising disciplines here are, are very focused on careers in lockdown. Um, uh, you know, uh, I think what you're seeing here on the left-hand side is um, these have been very, very interesting um, uh, disciplines that students have been searching for since the pandemic started in 2020. Um, the falling disciplines on the right-hand side, um, it's a bit surprising, but I think career opportunities are again being the big thing here. Uh, nursing staff have have, uh, have been at the forefront of treating COVID. Um, dentists have struggled to really deal with uh, the lockdowns. Um, and then petrochemicals, 
um, of course, are losing popularity uh, in general. So um, the findings here aren't, uh, are, aren't too um, surprising. Now, I want to take a quick look at uh, short courses so uh, we can see where the interest, whether it's increasing or decreasing. Now, on this slide, what we're seeing is uh, the time frame is from April of 2021 uh, through March of 2022, um, which is the post-COVID versus April of 2019 to March of 2020, which is pre-COVID. So what you're seeing here is um, it's an overlay. So 2019 would be 2019, 2020 will be on the bottom. And uh, uh, what, what you're seeing, if they're colored blue, we're seeing an increase in student interest uh, for online programs. Um, as you can see, United States, uh, UK, Ireland, for sure, we're seeing a huge growth there for our online programs, um, Germany and Switzerland, as well as Belgium. Um, the countries that we're seeing some decline, Australia, Netherlands, uh, Canada, and Italy. Um, the biggest being uh, in um, Netherlands and Italy and Australia being declined. Uh, but again, uh, I think this is partly to do with that um, students are now um, interested in coming back to campus uh, to have that face-to-face -face experience rather than taking these uh, uh, programs online. This here is um, the same time frame, so both pre-COVID and post-COVID. Um, and what this is, is students looking at uh, on-campus programs for short courses. So these are the top 10 countries. Um, again, what you're seeing here is Canada, Italy, Denmark, and Israel are seeing great growth for short courses uh, for bringing students to campus, whereas uh, UK, Netherlands, uh, France, and Norway are seeing uh, a steady decline year over year. This here is US specific. Uh, I know because I'm giving the, uh, the, the North American perspective, I wanted to include that. Uh, so this is showing you a more holistic view um, uh, at disciplines. Um, it's the same time frame, but what you're seeing is a, the, the popularity in um, offering short courses or certificate programs. Uh, the top programs that are, are jumping out is computer science and IT, humanities, law, agriculture, and hospitality. Um, and then the biggest drop has been in the art and design um, and uh, architecture as well as environmental studies um, and followed up by uh, journalism and media. This here is US specific. So those students looking at these programs, um, but taking them uh, online versus on campus. And uh, it's the same time frame. Um, what, you, what we are seeing is that uh, it's pretty similar to what we uh, saw on the, the, the last slide, although computer science has dropped um, uh, where students are preferring to take that face-to-face -face rather than online. Um, uh, engineering is also a steady drop as students are really looking at coming back to campus rather than taking these courses uh, virtually. Finally, this, this is a, a look at um, uh, campus um, only specifically uh, for, for programs in the US, uh, same time frame. Um, what we are seeing is that there is a decline for social sciences, uh, humanities, and applied sciences, um, but we're seeing a, a big increase for engineering and technology programs, computer science, education and training, and uh, journalism. So in summary, I know there's a lot of uh, information on this slide, but what I just wanted to point out is that we have a, a very large sample size of um, uh, our students, users, again, 52 million unique visitors using our site annually. Um, and again, it is a free service for them to use. Um, what, what this is really showing us is that the US is, uh, is rebounding um, uh, after the, the pandemic. Um, most of the recovery has been coming from the graduate side, which is good news for all of us on this call. Um, and although the pandemic has shown uh, the importance of differentiation, island programs have surged in interest when uh, the pandemic was in full swing. Short courses raised in popularity um, during the pandemic, um, and uh, they are starting to cool down uh, slightly. Um, but um, what you are seeing is, uh, particularly in the US, uh, the programs of interest that have really shifted um, where business managers have lost a little bit of appeal, appeal for on campus teaching. Um, it's remained stable for online. Um, computer science has been steady, but growing for online. 
uh, medicine and health has uh, fallen globally um, everywhere. Uh, engineering in the US uh, has um, kept its uh, share of interest um, better than um, anywhere else. And then finally, computer science and IT has emerged uh, as a post-pandemic story as uh, the, the type of program that students are most interested in. And that is all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Stephen. There are already some good questions uh, uh, following your presentation. So now, now is the time to, to move to the debate and discussion. And we've asked uh, Trisha Berry to facilitate this, this session. Trisha is the Associate Dean and Director of Clinical and Practicum Programs at Purdue Global. She oversees the clinical and practicum placement processes for the online health sciences, nursing and graduate psychology programs, and serves as the online medical assisting program chair. Uh, Trisha helped launch the online school of health sciences in 1996 and has served in a variety of capacities for Purdue Global. Um, Trisha uh, received the Director's Award from uh, AAA's Commission on Distance Learning in 2017 and the Spirit of Kaplan Award in 2015. Uh, Trisha, I'll let you uh, facilitate this session. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Pascal. And, and thank you, Lindsay and Steve, for great uh, information today. It's It was an interesting bookend because uh, Lindsay really talked to us a lot about program development and, and how we work through that process. Steve talked a little bit more about where the student interests are and, and how we're going to get them into our programs. And we all know we need a balance of that, right? We need to appeal to the students as they're coming into the programs. Um, but then in order to create appeal for the students, we have to make sure we have quality programs too. So there's a, a, a huge balancing act for all of us in our programs there. Um, I think probably, Steve, my first questions will be for you. And, and then Lindsay, you can chime in where you see it's applicable to your programs as well. Um, but one of the things that was going through my mind as I listened to what Steve talked about is that my perception, which could be completely wrong because I'm totally in the US all the time, um, but my perception is that online education was more well established in the US before the pandemic, and it was probably newer to a lot of the European institutions. So Steve, do you share that perception and did you see bigger changes in your data with online for specifically European based institutions, or am I just making stuff up as I go here? No, that's that's actually uh, uh, spot on. Um, I, honestly, I I think that uh, the many U.S. institutions have, were really kind of well equipped. Um, they were ahead of the game um, compared to um, their European counterparts. Um, uh, I do think that there there are some schools that um, were ahead of the game, particularly uh, those that um, are more on the, the computer um, sciences or or um, engineering type programs uh, in, in Europe, I think they were a little bit more um, savvy and, and ready to kind of um, approach uh, fully online um, versus some of the other disciplines that I think there was a little bit uh, longer kind of uh, uh, learning outcomes before they were able to kind of fully uh, adapt to a, a new kind of modality. And Lindsay, do you want to speak to that from the educator in Europe perspective? Yeah, I think in, in definitely in our case, um, it was it was actually funny in, in some respects. We had spent um, probably nine months before the pandemic hit coming up with a business plan of how we were going to move our programs online. And we had a five year plan of doing it, two programs a year over five years. And we were eventually going to build it up. Um, and then overnight, the pandemic hit and everything was online. Um, and it was funny, we, we surveyed our students uh, back in September 2020, which seems like a lifetime ago now, um, about what they wanted from their online learning experience, because there was a lot of training happening in our university. There was a lot of talk about recording lectures, chunking your content, lots of resources. And it just, it wasn't sitting well with me knowing our learners and knowing the supports that they needed. Um, so we kind of flipped the script and ignored all of the advice that the university was giving us based on the evidence we had collected from our students. 
and we delivered all of our programs synchronously online. So if our courses were due to be a Tuesday evening, 6.30 to 9.30 in the physical classroom, we replicated that online and we taught in the virtual classroom. And our, our teaching staff did a lot of work about trying to make those sessions engaging. So it's not just our learners staring at the screen for three hours, um, just like they, they would do in the classroom. So we, we made a lot of use out of breakout rooms, polling tools, all of those kind of things. But for our learners, it worked because these are, but the vast majority are working full time. They've got family responsibilities. And rather than having to dip in and out of a multitude of lecture recordings and materials throughout the week, they were able to continue and, you know, say to their families, OK, from Tuesday, 6.30 to 9.30, I'm online, I'm going to school, so I'm out for that time. And they're available the rest of the week. Um, and it really worked for us. Uh, we, coming into September 2020, really didn't know how our recruitment was going to go. Were we going to have students who are interested in studying online? And we ended up having our most successful year ever. Um, and it was a really good uh, experience for us in terms of widening access and participation, something we've been talking about for years, because we were able to reach people who were living in areas where they didn't have a higher education institution nearby, and they were never going to have a university experience because they weren't going to be able to travel to us. Um, and we had lots of people from Donegal and Mayo and lots of remote parts in Ireland um, who would never have chosen Cork because we were miles away and they were able to learn with us. We had a number of students uh, with physical disabilities who were never going to be able to learn with us, but they were able to have a really uh, a strong learning journey online. Um, so for all of the things we were trying to achieve and we had in our strategic plan for five years, um, COVID actually brought us a gift because everything had to happen overnight. Now, obviously it has been a huge learning curve um, and we've learned a lot from it and we've tried to tweak as we go um but for us yeah it's 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 been positive so i i could definitely see that the u.s universities were a step ahead of us um because we were starting from a very low base we had two of our 130 programs online before covid and now we're in a situation where 129 of them are going to remain online <laughs> you know yeah it's funny that you bring, oh, sorry i was just going to mention uh lindsay uh just how you brought up that uh, you were tapping into markets that you hadn't been in before, attracting students uh, down the road. Uh, we we heard that quite a bit from um, our university partners. Um, uh, they were very surprised that, that they were getting student interest from um, very obscure places that they hadn't gotten before. Um, and some of the things that we helped with in the short term, um, we looked at how can we help, since nobody's traveling anymore, how, how can we help them get their message out there um, and uh, uh, look at markets where they are feel, feeling um, or, or seeing, some, seeing those interests? So we, we help them with doing some promotion of um, some of their uh, virtual open houses. Uh, so we, we were um, augmenting some of their, their internal kind of marketing outreach uh, to, to really help make sure that they were reaching the right students at the right time. Yeah, and I think your statements about that open accessibility, Lindsay, really touched my heart. I did both my master's degree and my PhD fully online, and I would not have been able to do them if I had to go sit in a classroom because I was working full time. I had little kids. Life was happening. And so for me, part of the reason I'm super passionate about online education is because it gave me access I probably wouldn't have had otherwise. I'm curious, though, Lindsay, because in the United States, a lot of the focus with online education is flexibility and being able to do things when it works in your schedule. And that doesn't mean flexibility in academic standards, but just in terms of timing and how coursework is done. So I was interested when you said your approach was you kept class Tuesday night for the same chunk of time. Has that modified over time? And are you doing things more, with more flexibility for your learners? Or have you found that your learners like that approach? In general, they seem to like that approach. Um, the only things we have tweaked a little bit. Um, so all of the lectures are recorded. So anybody who can't attend on the Tuesday night can still watch the recording. Um, but in some of the newer programs, particularly the micro credentials we've developed, um, we've kind of introduced more of a flipped classroom model. So for those students um, who are mostly in industry, we're releasing some small chunks of content, recorded lectures, reading materials to them 
um, maybe five days in advance of their class and then the class is shorter so it's maybe an hour and a half two hours where they're coming and that's a really live session um, so it's engaging they're discussing things they're working in groups it's not chalk and talk it's it's more um, the lecturer or our, our instructor is the the guide on the side not the sage on the stage um, and and that approach has worked um, yeah, so while I, I and, and this is something we did struggle with, Trisha, because, you know, you would think, and, and I'm a working mom too, and I'm also in the midst of the last six months of a doctorate that feels like it has taken me 90 years to achieve with two small children at home. I know, so I know I that feeling. feeling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know that feeling. <laughs> um, and I have full empathy with all of our students. Um, but it just seems being able to mark off just a couple of hours is easier to do rather than saying I'm going to spend an hour a day working mm -hmm. on my course. Um, and we've surveyed the students numerous times since that first one in, in September 2020 and the overwhelming majority want us to stick with this approach. So I don't know, it, it kind of bucks the trends of everything we thought would happen and, and what all the uh, instructional designers and IT experts in our university were, were telling us, but it has worked. Yeah, and I think it's another great example of being student centered. So a couple of the questions we got, Lindsay, while you were presenting were around the approval process. And uh, I, you even mentioned the layers of bureaucracy sometimes in those kinds of processes. Um, because you have such um, a multi-layer process, has that sometimes um, made it difficult for you to modify programs based on student and employer feedback? And then kind of as a, as a supplement to that as well, are you using that same process with the micro-credentials or is that, are those processes done a little differently? Okay, so for uh, the main programs, yes, bureaucracy can be the biggest pain in my life at multiple stages through the years while I'm knee deep in paperwork and trying to get ahead of this department and that college and this school to sign off on things. But um, by and large, we try and make the processes work for us. So we hold uh, several meetings of our ACE Academic Standards Board throughout the year, so it gives us a forum to be able to respond quickly. So we have a meeting roughly every six weeks. Um, so there's an opportunity to change things every six weeks if we need to. Um, our team is very agile. We work quickly uh, when we need to ensure we're responding to a need because I suppose that directly contributes to the success of our programs. Another piece, I suppose, that comes into the mix is, like many um, adult and continuing education units, we are entirely self-funded. So we don't get core funding from the university. We don't get core funding from the state. So we are dependent on fee income to pay the salaries of our staff and to keep the lights on and the show on the road. So we have to be agile. We have to have, I suppose, that entrepreneurial mindset. Um, and, and one of our, we had a, a conferring ceremony, a graduation last week, and one of our external stakeholders was there and, and she was speaking to the president of our university. And she was just saying how amazing it was to work with our team because the word no is not in our vocabulary. So no matter what she asked for, we said, well, we don't do it right now, but we'll find a way. And that's just the team of people that we have in place. We always just, I suppose, relish the challenge and try and meet the need uh, because once once the need is identified and we know what our learners need, we'll make it happen somehow. Um, now, um, sometimes we are on the uh, seek forgiveness, not permission side of things, <laughs> just to keep things exciting. <laughs> yeah, well, that's what you have to do sometimes if you're going to be nimble, right? You, yes. you, yeah. yeah, sometimes, sometimes that's that just the easier approach. That, that just has to happen, it. yes. Yeah. Uh, then on the theme of micro-credentials, micro um, I suppose for us, the quality aspect of the micro-creds is really important. Um, and, and we're trying to get the message out that, you know, it's not credit for sale. We're not competing with uh, industry training providers. We're not just going to give you a certificate for turning up. Um, we're trying to offer something different. <laughs> yes, our industry courses are, they're industry specific, they're skills focused but there's a strong academic underpinning in everything that we do. So that differentiates us in the marketplace. 
Um, and I think our industry clients can see the difference in the quality of what we're offering. Um, and that helps us with repeat business as well. Um, and we tried to make the process of uh, a, a curriculum approval a little bit more streamlined um, for the micro credentials, but we've literally managed to strip out just one phase of it. Uh, we still have the full program approval, mini Viva uh, experience. So I think by the time I get to my own doctoral Viva, uh, I'll be well experienced given that I have probably 20 of these mini Viva meetings uh, throughout the year. Not very good for my blood pressure, but we, um, <laughs> we do survive. Um, and, and they are, as much as sometimes we kind of moan about them and think, you know, it's another bureaucratic step that we could do without giving the programs that that rigorous and robust interrogation at those panel meetings really does make them stronger when they come out the other side because there's always something that we won't have thought of that an external assessor will bring up that an employer will bring up that a student representative will bring up um, and having that feedback rather than just the program team sitting in an echo chamber all telling each other how well we're doing um, it's great to have those other voices there L L Lindsay May, may I ask you a, a question that um, was already uh, posted in the chat? Could you tell us a bit more how you involve various stakeholders uh, during the design process and which form does it take? Is it really like uh, who is involved and uh, in, in which way? Yeah, um, so I suppose I'm very much in favor of getting everyone around the table, whether that's the virtual table or a physical table. Um, usually uh, this kind of emerges with somebody will come to us. Someone will have heard, you, you know, there might be a company who's heard from one of their, um, their clients or one of their competitors that ACE and UCC have done something for them. So then they'll say, they'll come to me, they'll drop an email and say, we're interested in doing something with you or a community group will come to us. And our very first step is to get everybody around the table. And we start by trying to tease out what the need is. Is it a technical skill that a group of uh, staff in a pharma company need to acquire? Is it uh, a need to build resilience in managers? What exactly are they trying to achieve? Um, just yesterday, actually, I, I had a roundtable discussion with um, 10 companies on the development of two new micro-credentials. One is in the area of uh, building resilience in self and others for, for managers. And the other one is in, an, in the area of workplace change. Um, and we met with these companies back in, I think, the end of January, February, where they first expressed to us why they needed this. They were seeing burnout among managers because of the pandemic, given uh, they were worried about the, the level of change, you know, the whole um, moving back to the office or staying at home, a lot of change in the workplace. And they were trying to build capacity in their teams to be able to deal with that. So um, they told us what they needed in February. They told us what they were trying to achieve. We went away, spoke with our team, spoke with our academics. We drafted a, a proposal, put a, a plan in place about how we thought we could link into some uh, theory from a, a positive psychology uh, discipline area and, and build a program out from there. And we actually presented our programs, our, our proposals to the companies yesterday. And each of the employers were able to give us feedback um, on the content. We were able to discuss with them the best kind of delivery methods. And, and we're going into our program approval panel for those two programs next Monday. And we're able to take on board all of the feedback that was given to us and, and, and infuse that into the documentation. Um, and it was really a, a positive meeting because the companies have been involved in the process. They're invested in it. They're already starting to identify employees and their organizations that they're going to send on the programs. So it's, it's almost like a recruitment tool for us as well. Once these programs go live, there are students there ready to sign up straight away. Um, the companies at an organizational level are getting the skills that they need within their organizations to be able to survive. And we're meeting the need of both the learner and the organization. So it, it's, we try and operate on a basis where everything that we do is win-win for everybody. It's funny that you bring that up. I'm hearing that more and more from university partners that Upskilling is, is something that is essential and the, the stackable credentials um, and offering those so that 
uh, their, their current employees or those that they're trying to attract have the right skill sets to be employed. Um, one of the, the, the things we found right when COVID hit, the, the biggest spike in um, uh, program interest was entrepreneurial certificates. <laughs> so those are people looking to change jobs, change careers, um, and get the kind of experience so that they could um, move move up or move out into um, you know maybe be, being their own boss. So it's funny how uh, everything kind of uh, ties into each other, but really what we're hearing the most from university partners is that students are really looking at job outcomes. You know, what is this, what is this uh, degree gonna get me? What is this program gonna get me? Um, and, and that's, that's uh, what they're interested in. So it sounds like uh, at Cork, you guys are doing exactly what you know, the students are needing. It's great. Yeah, and, and Steve, this next question kind of follows up on, on what you just bridged us into. So thank you for that. And that is a question about apprenticeships. In your data, are you seeing uh, students asking for more of those types of experiences or are you tracking that kind of data at all? You know, unfortunately, we don't track that data. It's really on the institution side. Um, but um, what I've had, what I have heard from uh, my colleagues in UPSIA and uh, other associations that I'm, I'm affiliated with is that um, internships and externships are definitely very popular with with students. I'm particularly focused on the international space, so um, really a lot of international students are looking for OPT opportunities or potentially PPT. Um, and uh, if you're not familiar with that, but um, that is where they are allowed to work after they've finished their their degrees. Um, they can stay in the country uh, for a, a, a period of time to get some um, uh, work experience. And so that is something that we do see um, when. Uh, prospective international students are looking for an exchange program, they are definitely interested in OPT opportunities. St yeah. St yes. St Stephen, may I ask you a question? I'm gonna play the devil's advocate, but uh, uh, you were talking about job opportunities. Uh, yes. And can we equate job opportunities with quality or does it have to do also sometimes with just like reputation? You go to a top school, kind of whatever is a quality, you will get a top job. I know it's a bit uh, stupid I, question, I, maybe, but you know, I, I think um, nowadays uh, uh, students are more savvy, so they want to know what they're going to get out of the program. And so, if you're able to connect them with um, employment opportunities, or just like Lindsay was mentioning. Uh, the fact that they're they're having those external stakeholders as part of the conversation as they're developing the programs, it's essential. If you're able to bridge that and, and show students that there is a pathway to a job, um, it doesn't matter if you're a top tier one school or you're a mid tier school. I, I think uh, students are going to be interested in you because you're 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 delivering on a promise. So I. I don't think you're 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 out if you're not a top tier school. I think there's a lot of opportunity um, and there's a lot more competition out there. So um, if you're able to guarantee a job and um, put them in contact, maybe even uh, host a, a, a workshop on on campus where you bring employers on site where they can um, potentially get uh, a job or at least maybe it kind of goes back to Trisha's questions about the uh, internships or externships. Um, th that is a, a pathway to career. And so I think there are a lot of things that you could do to, to ensure that you're attracting and retaining students and, and uh, having good results. And I think it's a bit of an interesting shift in the US because traditionally in the United States, um, educa higher education has sort of not wanted to focus on employer. It, um, I don't even know how to say it without sounding inappropriate, but they've not wanted to focus on the employers. They've wanted to focus on the educational process and, and the academic process. So there has been at times in the United States sort of uh, uh, people looking down on programs that were really industry focused. And Lindsay, I wonder if you could talk to that um, if in, in your division, because I understand your division is really more adult learner focused and continuing education. How does that fit into the scope of your university and, and what's the dynamic there? Yeah, was, well, I suppose I, I see it in a way the university uh, at large for the undergraduate and postgraduate uh, courses, the traditional uh, courses in the university, it's almost a mentality of 
if we build it, they will come and they develop new programs and then sometimes are shocked when the students don't appear because the student the, the courses don't fit the need. Whereas we do things in the other way, we identify the need first and build the program up from there. And that's why they're successful. Um, and, and I think that responsivity that we have is really our unique selling point. And that's why we have built up a reputa reputation. Um, we work both with uh, industry and enterprise, but also on the community side, we do a huge amount of work with local community groups and the third sector as well. Um, and it's, it's just, our goal is always just to respond to the need where it is. And, and I think that's a little bit different to the traditional university mindset, but given what Steve is talking about, about the level of competition out there now, the traditional way of universities doing business is having to change um, because students are, as Steve said, more savvy and they're looking at, okay, if I invest four years of my life or their parents are investing quite a lot of money and in tuition fees and accommodation and all of that, where is it going to get me? What can I achieve? And now I'm a humanities graduate myself, so I'm, I'm totally in support of the arts and the skills that you can learn in courses that don't qualify you to be a something, a doctor, a dentist, a lawyer, whatever. Um, and I, I think there's learning and everything, but I think it, for the university, it's how we pitch that to learners, you know, and how we can tell them about the skills and the graduate attributes they will have when they leave a program, whether that be in computer science or social science, because there are, there, there are skills there that are applicable to, to workplaces right across the board. Um, so I, I think in, in some respects, while adult education is sometimes seen as the poor relation in the, the university or the, the second cousin, it's not part of the core mission. I think we can be very entrepreneurial in what we do and we're kind of leading the way in some respects and the traditional university is having to play catch up with what we're doing. Um, and we are, but, but I think there's a, there's a lot of learning that can happen from the way that we do our work. I also would say that the continuing ed side, they are a lot more nimble. Um, I, I, my experience, um, and prior to me joining Study Portals, I, I've worked in a university sec, uh, setting, um, and I was in the, the College Professional Studies and Advancement, and I felt like um, we were allowed a little bit more flexibility in, in coming up with new course offerings and um, formats and way we were delivering it, whereas uh, the traditional um, way you would deliver undergrad or graduate programs uh, are, are kind of um, uh, stuck in, in the, the way you always did things. Um, and I, I think now COVID has forced the universities to reassess, hey, uh, why can't we be as, uh, we don't have to be so rigid. Why can't we be as uh, flexible as the continuing side? Because that's what students are really looking for. Yeah, and in the US, there's a whole topic of student debt when they, they enroll in programs that don't lead to direct job outcomes too, but we won't go there. We don't have time for that today. That's a whole nother seminar. Um, Steve, kind of playing off that question, uh, what do you see as uh, differing perceptions in quality between various countries? Um, and then also, does does quality, you think, play a choice, the student's perception of educational quality play a choice in, in their decisions they make, or how much of a role does that play in their decisions? It does, and I think it does depend on uh, markets. Um, uh, China, for instance, you know, th they're all about rankings, um, and so the, the quality, it for them, when they're thinking about an institution, it's about um, rankings, and, and because a lot of that is based off uh, their parents and their per parents' perception. Um, there could be other markets, though, that um, uh, that it's more about um, the access that you're providing um, rather than um, just the, the the type of program that you're offering. Um, I think that uh, quality is something that is becoming a more of a more important for, for students because competition is um, blowing up else, uh, everywhere. And so um, to really differentiate yourself, you need to not just be um, offering a program, just offer it like an, an MBA. Uh, every, every school has an MBA, but what makes you unique? Um, so um, really 
um, providing the student something that is more tangible. Um, uh, I think that is something that is uh, essential for um, making sure that you're getting a, a, a student and they're feeling they're getting a, a quality education. Yeah, it's, it's a tricky proposition for sure. Yeah. And I, I think for those of us who are looking at international, um, being able to understand the market demands of wherever you are, you know, if you're looking for a broad base of students, the needs might be different. So your program's got to be fairly flexible to meet those needs as well. Some some definite creative problem solving that we're all doing as we enter this this next phase of things. Uh, Steve, there was a question here too um, from the chat. If you have any explanation for the increase in US higher education in the number of students in education and training programs. Yeah, and I think I, I hinted upon that before. Students are really looking to um, kind of uh, upskill. Um, we're, we're seeing more and more students that are um, career educators um, that they're looking to inherent, enhance their skill set, and so um, that's why I think we're we're seeing a big uptick. People um, not being happy with their job satisfaction, so they're looking at um, different opportunities to kind of uh, grow in an area where they can either advance um, in their current role or look to kind of jump into a, a whole another um, uh, career sector altogether. So. Um, I, I think that is going to continue. Um, what what uh, I started to talk about at the very beginning of my presentation was that you can't be reliant just on one or two markets uh, anymore. Um, you know, if anything, COVID uh, showed us that you know things can change on a dime, and you know we've had uh, visa restrictions or political unrest in certain markets, and so you know if you're not able to kind of tap into other ways of recruiting students or other markets, um, then you're putting yourself at risk. Uh, that well can dry, dry up. Um, there's a lot of countries that are actually having a conservative approach to internationalizations, bringing students um, to the, the host country. China is a good example. They are, um, they've got a, a, a goal to keep as many Chinese students from uh, not studying abroad, keep, keep them in-house and attract international students. And so, um, you know, uh, they weren't much of a player a few years ago, but now they are. And so a lot of schools that are really reliant on China or let's say India, um, you know, there, there's a lot more uh, schools going after that uh, smaller and smaller pool. So it's just uh, important for you to um, really uh, look at your offerings and, and see um, if the programs that you're, you're offering, if they're the right programs, um, kind of to Lindsay point uh, earlier, or do you do it backwards to say, what is the interest, what does students need, and then uh, develop your programs or redesign them based on that need rather than just offering a program because you feel like you need to offer it. Yeah, there's a great comment here in, in the chat that I think is worth us spending a couple of minutes on, and, and maybe we could get both of you to weigh in on this. Um, that we've not discussed the non-academic quality and that for international students, there has to be institutional support to include accommodation, cultural programs, learning support, opportunities to engage with local people. Um, do you, each of you wanna kind of uh, comment on your perceptions of that, the, the sort of support services that wrap around the academic piece? Um, I suppose for, from our point of view, uh, in ACE, we only run part-time programs and international students can't get visas for part-time programs, so we don't have international students. But uh, on the non-academic side of our programs, that's definitely a hugely important piece for us and one that we've been building on uh, over the last few years in terms of giving the students the same level of access to all of the university facilities that full-time students have. Um, this has been a big issue in Ireland for over a decade, um, and there, it's kind of summarized in a paper that's called a student is a student is a student, whether they're part time, full time, online, you know, they should all have equity in terms of the level of access that they, uh, to services that they have. Um, and then within my university, you know, five years ago, our students didn't have access to the sports facilities, they didn't have access to the gym, and we had to fight for that. They didn't have access to uh, workshops run by our skill center. We worked with them and we devised that again with the library. So 
as I mentioned before, I think sometimes in, in adult education, you're the poor relative and you're kind of forgotten about sometimes. So it feels like we are constantly fighting a battle for our students to have a parity of esteem with the full-time undergraduates and graduate students um, to have all of the, the, the same level of the non-academic services. And for adult learners, um, as I said earlier, the pastoral support bit for us is just critical. We would not have the high numbers of students completing that we have without that level of pastoral support. Um, because many of our students, uh, we were speaking just before we came on air, we had a big um, graduation ceremony uh, just last week. And my father, who's 63, was one of our students who was graduating having done a graduate study for the first time in his life, left school at 17 and went straight to the workplace. Um, and he would not have kept going through the year were it not for the level of pastoral support uh, that was provided because he was very anxious at the beginning of the year. He didn't know how to use the university virtual learning environment. He hadn't written more than a birthday card for 40 years, <laughs> you know? Um, so there was a lot of anxiety. There was a lot of imposter syndrome for the first, I would say two to three months of the course of thinking, I don't belong here, I don't fit in, um, and not having the confidence in his ability. Whereas now he can see that the life experience he had brought something to the classroom discussions, that the younger people in his cohort who had worked up through university just didn't have. And he can see now that his experience was on a par with what they had learned through academia. He had learned through the university of life. They had learned through formal education. Um, so I think that that non-academic support piece really is, is critical for, for the adult learner. You know, in, interestingly enough, and, and the reason I know you send sponsors these seminars is for us to look at parallels between the US and, and Europe, and then also to look at the differences and where adult ed and continuing ed falls in absolutely parallels between the US and Europe. It's it's the same kind of thing on, on the US side that um, our adult students tend to sort of take a back seat and tend to sort of be a second thought. Uh, and there are many folks who have to fight for that same kinds of exact things you've describe Lindsay. So I don't know if I'm glad that it's a parallel between the US and Europe, but it definitely is uh, something that's very similar. We're all suffering in solidarity, I think. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's good to know you have friends in the same spot, right? Uh, Steve, just, do you want to touch on the yeah, wraparound? I was, gonna, I was gonna add it's a wraparound services are essential. Um, it should be available to both domestic and international students, um, lifelong learners. I think everybody should have access to that. I think the biggest thing that um, you we can all do as an individual on your campus is um, help change the conversation, change the narrative. Um, what happens a lot of times on these campuses is domestic students are con considered our students and then the international or yours, instead of saying ours, they're all our students. Um, so if you can get a shared language, a commonality, where you're, you're thinking about them as, uh, you know, uh, no different than, than uh, your traditional um, uh, domestic student. The other thing that many institutions that I'm hearing um, in the US and Canada um, have been doing, they've been uh, hiring a lot of um, uh, internal ambassadors. So students that are active um, in programs, um, international students maybe, and they're, they're doing like a peer mentorship where they're connecting students when they come on campus. So um, they can get all their questions asked and answered like, where, where's a great place to get like a, a sandwich or where can I get sushi, you know? Uh, so it's, it's a good way to um, kind of answer the questions and make the, the student feel support from day one. Um, so there's little things that you can do in, internally um, to make it a, a great experience for that international students because um, what I know from my experience when I studied abroad, um, I actually studied abroad in Ireland, um, my home campus considered me a transfer student when I came back. Um, I had to do all the articulation agreements myself. I got over to the campus in Ireland and at that time, several, several, several years ago, um, I didn't have a lot of experience. I, I really looked to the other international students that were um, uh, on my exchange program to kind of uh, rely on them. Um, I think we're in a different day where students are savvy, they expect more, and they're gonna be looking for those wraparound services. And so um, you, as we all know, 
uh, a student can sell the experience better than anybody else. So if they have a good experience, they'll go back and they'll tell all their friend, family and friends about it. And it's a, it's a natural pipeline for future, future enrollments. Yeah, and I know we need to wrap up because we're at the end of our time. I would just, I'm gonna challenge a little bit of what Steve said there for folks to think a little bit bigger on that too, because we don't just have campus-based schools anymore. We have institutions that are fully online and, and I'm a big advocate for that. I've already shared that. Um, I work for an institution that's fully online. We don't ever see our students face-to-face. -face. So I think to some extent, it's important that folks shift their thinking from just being campus-based to thinking about that online context. We have uh, we have students from all over the place and, and online is kind of cool because it equalizes some of that. I don't know what shape, size, color, race, ethnicity, anything my students all are. But because you don't know that, it makes it harder to relate to the student and know what's happening with them as well. Because if you don't understand their context, it might be difficult for you to build that relationship and present information in a good way for them. So that's all, I think, big stuff to think about as we're moving on from this and, and really looking at how we serve the students, not just that face-to-face -face situation, but also in the online context. And with that, I will turn it back over to Pascal because I know we need to wrap up. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Tricia. I'd like to, to thank very much Lindsay, Stephen and Tricia. Uh, I think that was a very stimulating discussion. I think quality is really of uh, growing importance and we're going to, I think every participant today is going to look at his uh, processes within its own institutions following those great presentations. Um, this seminar was brought to you by uh, UCAN, AAAs, and UPCA. I think today we really saw the power of uh, collaborating on this type of, uh, of event. That was really, really great. Thank you very much to, to everybody. Before we leave, um, Carme wanted me to say a few words about the UCAN conference, annual conference, after two years of uh, online events. We're going to meet again in, uh, in Budapest uh, from the 8th to 10th of June, two months time, no less, uh, one, one month and a half. Uh, the theme of this conference will be uh, university lifelong learning today and tomorrow, uh, HEIs for higher quality and more inclusive knowledge transfer. Uh, we really encourage you to come. It will be great to meet again uh, in a face-to-face -face event. Uh, we all know that uh, there are exchanges we can only have in uh, this type of events. So we are really looking forward to it. Really, don't hesitate to uh, don't hesitate to uh, to register for this uh, for this conference. Thank you very much again to the speakers, uh, the UCAN Secretariat, which made it all possible. Uh, we will give you a rendezvous for, for next year for the, or even before, but uh, at least I guess this uh, uh, across the Atlantic uh, seminar will, is becoming really an uh, important uh, event on the calendar of the three institutions. Thank you very much again, and I think we're going to close here have a great uh, have a great day thank you everyone thank you everyone thanks everyone bye bye bye